Welcome everyone, thank you for coming. Um, my name is Noelle Hutton. I'm an organizer with Community Alliance for Global Justice. And tonight's event, as you know, will be about indigenous food sovereignty and the role of solidarity. We will hear from three Pacific Northwest scholars and activists in just a moment here. But first, as we gather virtually, let us, can't see the interpreter. <laughs> Is everything okay on the interpreter end? Rachel, um, I'll keep going. Um, as we gather virtually, let us take a moment to recognize the place in which we are currently. The lands, waters, and ancestral homes which we are among. I'm calling you today from Tetsuge Olinge, the traditional and continued territory of many Tewa peoples and one of the eight northern pueblos in New Mexico. If you're not sure who has tended to the place you are today, the map at native-land.ca uh, is one starting point, but only if we recognize its limitations. Community Alliance for Global Justice is an organization based in Seattle. If you are too, we would um, encourage you to consider contributing to realrentduwamish.org. This is one small example of how we can own up to historical and continued wrongs to Native communities by doing something material to change the colonial state under which we are living that was never built for the peoples who have long cared for this world. We also want to address more context for the time in which we are gathering. Um, you can go to slide two. In the past few months, Hundreds of unmarked graves of Indigenous children from the boarding school era are finally being unmasked across Canada. And below our feet here in the United States, when there, where there were more than 350 of these sites of cultural genocide, there is no question that the same violent dispossession of future generations stole countless lives and life ways from Native communities, past and present just as the lands and waters here have been and continue to be stolen. So for those of us who are fortunate enough to be guests here today, this conversation is a hope that we may learn how to be good guests, how to be in solidarity with indigenous communities whose traditional ecological knowledges have allowed this corner of the world to be so beautiful and abundant and whose careful tending to the food systems here have allowed so many of our staples across the world today. Corn, tomatoes, potatoes, peppers, chocolate, the list goes on. And not to mention salmon, whose ecologies are now deeply threatened. Um, you can go to the next slide and the next slide. Um, so to briefly introduce the subtopic for tonight, which is genetically engineered salmon, we want to show a short film we co-produced, Community Alliance for Global Justice, as well as Muckleshoot Food Sovereignty Project and New Canoe Media in 2018. The film features important Native leaders in the long struggle against GE salmon. This includes Valerie Seagrest of the Native American Agricultural Fund and Muckleshoot Food Sovereignty Project, whose knowledge on the subject was the impetus for CAGJ's campaign a number of years ago as well as Vaughn Sharp, Vice President of the Quinault Indian Nation and President of the National Congress of American Indians. Unfortunately, neither of these two wonderful people could join us today, but you'll be able to hear a bit from them here in the film. And so now we can start playing the short film. It's about three and a half minutes our lives around salmon. Archaeologists can date it back to at least 10,000 years. And if you ask any Muckleshoot person or Coast Salish person, they would say it's since time began. Salmon is the pillar of our culture. And we took care of that species just as it has taken care of us and upheld our health. And now it needs our help more than ever. A Boston-based techno corporation is genetically modifying salmon eggs on Prince Edward Island in Canada. It's taking genes from three different fish and creating an unnatural species with three sets of DNA, which they then fly to Panama, where it's raised in crowded cement pens. This creature grows two to three times faster than normal. It's aggressive. It feeds ravenously. 
Its flesh has less protein, less healthy fats, fewer vitamins and healthy acids than wild salmon. It's recently become the first genetically modified animal cleared for food use in the United States. The Quinault Nation opposes genetically engineered salmon because we believe very strongly that the salmon were gifted to our ancestors from the Creator. And when the Creator made and designed salmon, it was perfect. And for man to think that they could somehow modify it and make it better is, is very arrogant. It's not right. Nothing we can do as human beings can restore a wild stock once it's gone. So if we can't live with worst case scenario, what are we doing even thinking about going there? My name is Louis Ungaro. I'm a Muckleshoot tribal member. I've been a lifelong fisherman my whole entire life. Fishing has been something that has really formed me into who I am. It's taught me how to live. Um, it's taught me how to adapt. It's given me strength. At one time, there was 100% of habitat around here, and you can look behind me and see your precious habitat where our babies are trying to navigate and to get out to make their cycle and come back home to their ancestral rivers. I think that you have to go back and you have to do your work with habitat. You know, these things that we have out here are gifts from God. They're gifts, and you need to take care of them. And if you don't take care of them, they'll be taken from you. We're going to have an opportunity to build that solid foundation for future generations to build, because ultimately, we are the Salmon people. We are the Coast Salish people, the Salmon people. We are Coast Salish people, we are Salmon people, and this is our cause. Thank you for sharing that, Erica. I mean, not Erica, Rachel. Um, you know, we have some slides next to go with a short overview about um, community alliance for global justice background with GE Salmon um, since this film was released in 2018. Um, so, GE Salmon is the first genetically engineered animal, not just in the United States, but anywhere in the world to be approved for human consumption. Thus, what happens with GE salmon is setting precedent for all future GE food animals. Next slide. Yet, salmon are a vital keystone species to the food and lifeways of indigenous communities, particularly in the Northwest. GE salmon is being produced and now sold without the free prior and informed consent of the salmon people who have been the protectors of these beings and ecosystems since time immemorial. Next slide. So since this film was released in 2018, some major events have happened. In 2019, GE Salmon was approved for sale in the US. Before this, it had only been approved in Canada. In November of last year, a US federal court ruled that the approval of genetically engineered salmon was unlawful due to insufficient environmental review. However, this does not prohibit Aquabounty from selling their product in the US as more environmental reviews continue. Next slide. And due to ongoing pressure from activists, major food companies have publicly rejected GE Salmon, including retailers like Costco, Aramark, Sodexo, and Compass Group. And next slide. And recently, the Block Corporate Salmon Coalition of which CAGJ has been a part, and Carl, who will be speaking today, has been too. They have been critical in these wins, which has been facilitated largely by the organization Uprooted and Rising. Next slide. Oh, that's on UW campus, that painting. Um, University of Washington. Um, in May of this year, Aqua Bounty began their first harvest of GE salmon for the US market. Next slide. 
and one seafood distribution company has been public about that they will be selling GE salmon and they're based in Philadelphia called Samuels and Sun Seafood. But Samuels and Sun Seafood sells primarily to restaurants where there are no labeling requirements for GE foods like there are in supermarkets. Because of this blatant lack of transparency, you probably wouldn't know if you were eating GE fish. So clearly, this is an urgent and completely under-publicized threat to indigenous sovereignty, treaty rights, food, and lifeways. It is the threat to all the waterways where we eat, work, and play. And the genetic engineering of animals is a fundamental disrespect to the well-being of our food systems, ecosystems, and self-determination of all peoples and more than human animals. And you can end the slides. Um, we'll come back to that one later. So with that, our panelists are gonna take us on a deeper dive into their work with indigenous food sovereignty movements. We'll talk about the significance of GE salmon, not GE salmon, of wild salmon to native communities and the threat of GE salmon and what it would look like for those of us who are not native to be in solidarity with their leadership. And thank you to CAGJ volunteers and Rise Up or Summer School organizing collective members, Sam Schaefer and Erica Mazza-Smith for moderating this next section. Hi everyone. Um, thank you so much, Noelle, for that really beautiful and thorough introduction. Um, so to start us off, um, we are going to have our panelists introduce themselves and tell you a little bit about their work, who they are, and, um, oops, sorry, I'm trying to find all my notes. Uh, I'm also just a heads up to everybody. If I cut out. Um, my computer is very unreliable. So if someone um, in the organizing collective could please let me know, I will slow down or repeat myself. Thank you. Um, okay, so um, welcome to all of our panelists. And if you all could begin by telling us a bit about who you are, your background in food sovereignty and um, other indigenous led movements that you may be a part of, um, that would be wonderful. And we will start with Charlotte, if you will, you're first on my screen. Good day or good evening, everyone. Uklama Lotis, Lotis Mayo. Mamakne um, MT Charlotte, Zisha Aksuma, Hisbek Shitla, Zuma As, Nuchano Hatin. My um, uh, native name or Koa's name, uh, Nuchano's name is uh, Flotis. It means carrying thunder. It comes from my whaling ancestry. Um, my English name is Charlotte, Charlotte Kote. I am from um, the area known as Tsuma'as, which is now recognized as the city of Port Alberni uh, on the west coast of Vancouver Island. I am Tsushot um, from the nation of, of the New Channel Nation. We are one of the 14 groups that make up the New Channel Nation. I'm very happy to be here today. I um, uh, want to recognize that I'm not in my territory. I'm in the ancestral homelands of the Duwamish, Sequamish, uh, Tulalip, uh, the Puella peoples, um, Muckleshoe peoples, the people recognized as Coast Salish, and more specifically where I work, I teach at the University of Washington um, in, in the on the Seattle campus, and uh, our campus is on the ancestral homelands of the Duwamish people. So I wanna make sure that that is being recognized and I also want, I don't know who is here today and where you're all from, but it would be nice to share as Noel mentioned, um, if you know the name of the tribe or the First Nation where you are situated to um, put that in the chat so that we can see that and maybe a little bit about yourself. We are 
you know, we're the panelists, we're the people who will be speaking and you'll know more about us. It'll be nice to know something about you as well. So we'd love that. Pleco, Ushak Shaklayet, thank you to the uh, Community Alliance for Global Justice for this wonderful invitation to serve on this and to speak on this panel with these uh, amazing um, uh, fellow panelists. And I look forward to hearing their presentation as well. Um, I'm very involved with uh, indigenous food sovereignty and um, I do have a presentation, so I don't know if I'm supposed to give that now. I guess I'll, I'll wait and see, but um, I do, um, I've been working in the area of indigenous health and wellness and more specifically indigenous food sovereignty for many years. And um, for the last nine years, I have uh, chaired and oversaw the Living Breath Indigenous Food Symposium at the University of Washington, which I found founded and continue to um, uh, serve on. Uh, other areas where I have been involved, um, especially in uh, nonprofit work, is the Potlatch Fund Foundation here in Seattle. I served for 14 years, I think, or 13 years on that um, board and uh, for eight years served as the president of the Potlatch Fund. And I am now currently serving on the uh, Naha Ilihi Fund uh, board and um, very excited about the work we're doing around indigenous food sovereignty, which is one of the reasons why I really wanted to um, um, work with these wonderful women. It's an indigenous female led organization and food sovereignty is um, one of the main areas that we uh, focus on. Um, let's see, I think, I think that's it for now. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Charlotte. I'm so excited to get to hear you speak some more. Um, and next, I'll pass it to Carl. Would you please introduce yourself and share a little bit about your background and the movements you're connected with? Well, I think you are muted. Uh, there we go. Yeah. Okay, can you hear me now? Hello? Uh -oh. Yeah, I can hear you. Okay. Oh, yeah. Chamai, uh, you, uh, you, you, uh, you, uh, you, uh, my, uh, welcome. Thank, thank you for coming, Kuyana. Uh, one of, one of the things that I, I, I start off with my, my Yupik name, that's my ancestral name. Uh, my English name, obviously, is Carl. I was born and raised uh, in Alaska, traveled a lot as a child, so uh, went to fish camp every summer, but went to school K through 12 in what is uh, the north, northernmost specific uh, ice free port. I wanted to recognize that I'm currently on uh, Coast Salish land. It, uh, people have been removed here in uh, Sepulba. So I, 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 all I have is an English translation, so I need to talk with some, some other elders about the, in this island where I'm at, but everybody was left after the uh, Treaty of Medicine Creek, so it's Puyallup and Duwamish territory uh, on this island. But I, I also, uh, I think, you know, on the background, you know, I've I, uh, been working on food sovereignty since I was a teenager. And part of that is just, or since I was a kid, and a big part of that is going to fish camp and uh, continuing our, our way of, of being human uh, uh, in our traditional ways of uh, Yupik. And the Yupik uh, ways of, uh, of being human are not disconnected from the environment. So, uh, uh, and from the natural world. And I get involved, uh, particularly about four years, four or five years after the Exxon Valdez oil spill. Um, I was just a, just a young kid when that spill happened along the, along the North Pacific coast. It impacted, it's still today, even though it's, that was 1989, still today there's multiple marine and coastal species that have been affected, uh, um, including uh, a huge proportion of uh, our 
traditional foods. So, so, so I, that's really that awareness as I got older and then uh, really joined the global movement against the World Trade Organization in 99 in Seattle. And um, I believe that's where uh, the, the, the Alliance for Global Justice uh, kind of formed after that as well. And, uh, and then I started working uh, with a bunch of tribes in Alaska um, to protect subsistence rights. So these are hunting, fishing, gathering rights, either uh, inherent rights. We've never left land. We never, we never even fought the United States. Um, they just legislated through Congress a unilateral acts of, of genocide and apartheid against the native people in Alaska. It's a little bit different. It's an advanced form of, of, of genocide. And we're still dealing with that. It's called Alaska Native Claims Settlement Act. But on that, on that act, it was said we, it's, it just, uh, it was Congress created a, anyway, long story short, we're, we're, we're still continuing to harvest, uh, gather our medicines and plants from the, from not only the, the tundra, the, the mountains and the, and the ocean and the coast, but uh, we're also continuing our hunting and fishing rights as well. So, so I, in, in that context on the global movement, I, uh, you know, I've worked with the U.S. Food Sovereignty Alliance, a number of other grassroots alliances over the last 20 years. Um, and uh, I'm uh, currently, uh, yeah, currently been working also with the, uh, um, with the uh, stop, uh, stop corporate salmon campaign on GE salmon. So that's, that's been a, been a challenge. We started in 2009 in Alaska uh, to stop the GE salmon. That was when I was working with Alaska and the tribal council. So we worked with uh, bipartisan senators uh, along the West Coast and Alaska. So anyways, uh, thank you all for coming here. Thanks for CAGC, um, our uh, Peanut Alliance for uh, Global Justice. Um, and um, and also everybody for coming here. Appreciate it. Thank you so much, Carl, and for sharing um, a little bit about who you are and where you come from and all the ways um, you're arriving here with us today. Um, and last but not least, I'd like to invite Zoltan to tell us a little bit about you and who you are. And you've got a short presentation that we'll see the beginning of now and the rest of later so oh i'll just uh introduce myself a little bit a little bit okay. now um my name is zoltan grossman and uh good evening and thanks to all the organizers of this event it's great to see charlotte and carl again i'm a professor of geography and native studies at the evergreen state college in olympia on squaxin island uh, tr uh treaty territory we just raised the flag of the tribe over our campus um i learned about alliances though not from uh, being a professor uh, but from being a, a non-native treaty rights activist in both wisconsin and in washington so uh, that's where i learned the ropes of uh, of what i'm going to be presenting today i don't uh, study native cultures even though i'm in native studies i really study the native non-native relationship um, between uh, tribal and non-tribal governments, between border towns and reservations, uh, both the conflict and cooperation. Um, so in many ways, I'm studying the neighbors of the tribes and uh, see my role as uh, trying to remove some of the obstacles and barriers to tribal sovereignty uh, that are put in place by my communities and uh, my government. Uh, I'll have lots of slides later, mainly for the visuals. Um, I uh, use a lot of photos, and as a geographer, I'm using maps to basically give an overview of some of the alliances that have already happened uh, for salmon watershed restoration, for fossil fuel resistance, for climate resilience, but really with the same story that uh, treaties are good for the land and water and fish for everyone. Treaties help everyone. So. Uh, thanks so much and uh, look forward to hearing Charlotte and Carl. Thank you so much, Sultan. Um, I'm also very excited to hear your perspective, which it comes from such a unique intersection 
Um, so thank you for being here to all of you. And um, let's dive into our next question. So um, we at CAGJ are focused on food sovereignty and um, specifically indigenous food sovereignty means something particular and it means something very important and um, distinct. And we're wondering if you can tell us all about what do you believe makes indigenous food sovereignty unique? And um, I'd love to start off with Charlotte once again, uh, who's written about this and can tell us from your perspective, what, what makes indigenous food sovereignty something distinctive and unique and that we all need to understand? Okay, I'm going to open up my screen and I probably can do this in two sections because I have one on salmon too. So I, I'll do the food sovereignty and then I can, if we have time, I can share what I have on salmon. Um, let's see what happened. Why is it showing that? Can you see my screen? Anyone? We can see your screen and we see it in um, like creation mode. Um, you if you want to put it in presenter. We see oh. presenter mode. How about now? Both of your screen, like with your notes. Now we see it correct. Awesome. Okay. Perfect. So yeah, so I just, I, I've got some um, slides here that I'll go through and I'll make sure maybe somebody can give me um, you know, I don't know what, maybe into five minutes. Um, and I just want to provide a little context for what we mean when we talk about food sovereignty. And so I started with this with a quote that I use in my book and it actually became the title of my book. And it's uh, a happy tzishad has a drum in one hand and a sockeye in the other. And if you are Northwest Coast Indigenous, you know exactly what I mean because the food always comes with singing and dancing and uh, ceremony and prayer because it isn't just about feeding our bodies, it's about feeding our spirits and feeding our minds as, as uh, Valerie Seacrest and Liz Crone say in their beautiful book that they published a few years ago. This is what I hope will be a, the um, cover of my uh, upcoming book, A Drum in One Hand, A Sakai in the Other. It is a photo of this beautiful um, beach, a communal beach that my family, I, I live, was born and raised in my, my community of Tzishat, and this is our, our family beach. And this uh, was um, an afternoon, late evening or late afternoon when we were kutchising or um, smoking fish on an open pit fire. If you've never had sakai this way, you're missing out. This is the best way to eat sakai. And that's my sister in the background um, with her drum up to Tsuma'as, to the, to the uh, river that runs through our territory. And just a little bit about myself. And I, if anyone wants a copy of this um, slide um, presentation, I'm more than happy to share it. Um, just because in our culture, you have to, you know, you don't start speaking without telling people who you are. And these are just a couple of uh, maps showing where we are, traditional territory, which, as I mentioned earlier, um, is now what is the city of Port Alberni. It was our winter village, but we were forced there after colonization. Um, we also have um, traditional ancestral homelands in what is recognized as a broken group of islands on the west coast of Vancouver Island. And uh, we, there's a place there, and I don't know if you can see my little arrow, right here, there's a place on this island that became known as Benson Island because as part of the uh, colonization is the eraser and mapping over our names. But there's a place there called Zisha, and it's where we were created right? And we can walk right to the spot on that island where we are created. I want to begin with this because we talk about food sovereignty and many people don't know what food sovereignty is and where that term comes from. It was coined in 2007 and it's the right of peoples to healthy and culturally appropriate food produced through ecologically sound and sustainable methods. Um, and then 
goes beyond that and looks at the aspirations and needs of those who produce, distribute, and consume food, and that these should be at the heart of food systems and policies. Well, why is that important? Why is it important to have a global recognition or a, a global um, uh, food regime that focuses on food sovereignty? Um, well, this is something that I really thought about during COVID, you know, when we had so many and we still have so many people in, you know, in the upper echelons of society who are talking about how we can become safe societies again with the spread of this global pandemic. But the media, the health officials, politicians focus on a vaccine and physical distancing to stop the spread of this global pandemic. But little attention has been placed on the foods we eat, on nutrition, and on making ourselves healthy to fight these viruses. And it's something that um, I look at a little bit in the in my book. Um, my, my book had, had been completed when we when the, we had the out, first outbreak, um, but I added a little bit of material, and I plan to do more research in this area. Why is it important? It's because it's important because of what we have done as a larger global nation to our food industry, and that is with the industrialization of foods beginning in the 1940s and 50s and the commodification of foods so that we're growing foods for money and we're not growing food for health. Um, and so I have on here a couple of short videos um, um, that are trailers for these very, very, very well done films, Food Inc, Fast Food Nation and Fed Up that look at the global food industry. And these are a couple of photos. And if you don't know anything about the evil Monsanto, you need to go out and, and find more, get some information. I'm not gonna talk about Monsanto here, but Monsanto is um, one of the leading um, uh, um, international or national um, body that's focusing on genetically modified foods. Um, uh, I have in the middle this um, this little comic. I'm sick and tired of being fed antibiotics, hormones, pesticide, contaminated grain, and ground up parts of our own relatives. And that really is true if you really start looking deeply at what is happening to um, not just the animals in the the industrialized food system, but the plants as well. And um, the, uh, the, the image in the middle, I think is really telling on what we're seeing today and what has happened with our foods and that people are being fed by the food industry, which pays no attention to health and are treated by the health industry, which pays no attention to food. Um, very um, uh, important, uh, especially today with what is happening. Um, and it is continuing to happen with these new variant, var uh, variants in the COVID, um, our, our fight against COVID. So one of the questions that was posed to us was what makes indigenous food sovereignty specific and unique in relation to the broader world of food justice and sovereignty? And I wanted to speak to that and I'll take a few minutes in looking at this question and then I will stop, the, stop my, my slides and, um, open it up for the, the question for my um, fellow panelists as well. We can talk about indigenous food sovereignty without talking about settle, settler colonialism. And I have a, a quote here from my, um, my new book and it comes from um, the, um, the scholars who you see um, in the bottom of this quote. Settler colonialism as contrasted with colonialism includes displacement and replacement. Um, settlers come with the intention of making a new home on the land, a homemaking that insists on settler society having domain or, or having power and authority over everything within that new do domain. Uh, indigenous peoples must be erased, made into ghosts, and this eraser includes stripping indigenous people of our self-sustaining authority, as Tuckyang and Coltard um, uh, assert. You can talk about um, what is happening to us as indigenous peoples, what happened to us and what led to food insecurity without talking about boarding schools. And I'm glad, Noel, that you did um, discuss what we're seeing today with these, um, uh, the, uh, un this unsettling news about these um, un unmarked graves within these um, boarding school sites. We had a boarding school right in the middle of my community um, in Zishat that um, we are now um, 
um, moving forward to um, look at what, and, and we know it already. I mean, many people in my community have talked about this for years since I was a young girl about there being graves there that um, have never been reported. And we're starting to look into that as well. It's un it really is unsettling. Um, and it, it is hard to talk about as well. Um, the boarding school, you can't talk about what happened to us without talking about the boarding school. And I just have some information here about when boarding school started, what, you know, the difference in the US boarding school system and the Canadian boarding school system, but both of them having the same philosophy of assimilating indigenous children, young ch uh, indigenous people into the larger, um, the larger mainstream US and Canadian society. And not just that, but the eradication of our cultures through this motto, kill the Indian, save the man. And in my book, I say, you know, you have to look at collective historical trauma and how it's framed within a context of loss for these children, for our communities, loss of family, loss of community, loss of language, loss of culture, and loss of the innocence through the rampant physical, emotional, and sexual abuse that these children suffered in these institutions. And I know firsthand because the, the generation above me, all of the, the people within that generation went to boarding school and not one came out of there with a, anything good to say about the boarding school system. I don't know why this doesn't have, uh, why it's not showing anything on here. I do have a quote on there. Oh, there, yeah. This is um, Tammy. Can we do a quick interpreter switch? Would that be all right? Yes. Thank you. And I think I have maybe three slides and then I will stop just to let you know. Thank you. Let me know, Tammy, when I can start again. I think you're ready. Yep. Thank you. Awesome. Okay. So the, tra the tragic leg uh, legacy of boarding school had a disastrous impact on our dietary and emotional and spiritual well-being and socioeconomic status this is because of the perpetuation of settler colonialism continues to undermine our communities. We also can't leave out the fact that many indigenous peoples live in urban centers. In many cases, over 50% of communities live in the urban centers. So we have to recognize that as well. And a lot of that from forced migration, and also just the inability for us to sustain ourselves within these communities and these smaller um, areas that were part of our ancestral homelands that we're forced into after colonization. Um, so disease and health in native communities, globally, we as indigenous peoples have the worst health and nutrition because of these forced dietary changes. Many of these boarding schools um, were the, the breeding grounds for, for disease. They became the breeding grounds for disease. Our children were not fed, uh, and our indigenous children were not fed healthy foods there. In fact, um, if anyone has looked recently at um, studies done on boarding schools in Canada, there were food experiments that were done on children in the 40s and 50s. Um, I also write about that and what how these foods that children are forced to eat led us down this road of unhealthiness. Um, and also with lifestyle changes that we see um, in most de um, developed countries with more sedentary lifestyles, um, also um, being part of that, um, um, being a factor in that rise of diseases, um, heart disease, diabetes, rheumatoid arthritis, autoimmune diseases, all of these diseases we're seeing rising, but because of settler colonialism, we see it impacting our indigenous communities even that much more. And then I have a, a quote here from Nancy and um, Catherine Turner. Oh, and then the, the, the other part is on salmon. So I wanna leave it there just to, to give you that little bit of a background why indigenous food sovereignty is important. And I hope as I was going through this that you did understand the, the difference in what food sovereignty is. When we think about food sovereignty and, and the need for um, uh, uh, peoples throughout the world to have access to nutritious foods and specifically for indigenous peoples to have access to nutritious and traditional foods. But 
the difference is we still have the ongoing effects of colonialism within our communities that we continually struggle against. And because we're place-based societies, that means that whatever impacts our communities, whatever impacts our ancestral homelands, whatever impacts our waterways impacts us, impacts us in a cultural way, it impacts us in a spiritual way. And we see a lot of changes as a result of um, um, the, well, not just the perpetuation of colonialism, but also with global climate change, with the warming of the waters here along the Northwest coast, the uh, ocean acidification and the impact of uh, on our salmon as a result. So we're looking not just at genetically modified foods and more specifically genetically modified um, salmon, but also these other factors that contribute to what we see in our communities um, and the uh, rise of diseases and unhealthy um, lifestyles within our communities as a result. So let me stop that share so that I can pass it over to my fellow panelists. Tako, thank you everyone. Charlotte, thank you so much for that um, deep dive and overview. Um, there's so much more to everything you said and so much research for us all to carry out on our own as well. And um, highly recommend for everyone to check out Charlotte's writing and all the work that she's produced and shared. Um, I want to invite Carl to add to this question of what makes Indigenous sovereignty unique um, before we hop over to our next question. And Zoltan, if there's anything you want to add as well, um, but you'll have your question that you are also expert in that we're excited to hear from you on. Um, so Carl, is there anything you'd like to add here or respond to anything Charlotte shared? Is that better? Yeah, so I, yeah, thank you, Charlotte, for the, that great overview. I think um, covered it in a good context of federal, the, the, the explaining colonialism and uh, the effects of that on our, not only our food systems, but our health. And I think that's, uh, that's pretty relevant regarding, uh, especially in the Arctic, considering that these, uh, the, these toxins, these toxic chemicals are colonial products as well. That are contaminating our the Arctic, they fall out. So there, there, there's these these very very same food industries that are using all these uh, toxic chemicals on uh, on on pesticides uh, and and uh, you know manipulating uh, the the seeds so that indigenous peoples uh, have to rely on some corporation for seeds and uh, and that that's a it's a it's an insult to 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 to, to Mother Earth. Really, but uh, I, I think within the within the, the greater greater context of food, you know, food sovereignty, um, you know, it is directly also connected to land and the separation uh, from the that's that's part of the, the the problem with the Western systems of and colonialization is that it's a is that extreme separation of of of, of human beings from the environment. And that's uh, pretty evident if anybody's, uh, you know, even, 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 the, even I got a bachelor of arts degree for, uh, in biology. And there I learned how to separate myself from life on the earth. And like it's like, and so even in that process, that's a Western education. I, uh, you know, I decolonized that. I'm like, well, no, I'm a, I'm Yupik, so I'm Yupik, so Yupik, I'm a Yupik biologist. I don't separate who I am from, from the study of life uh, on this earth. So anyway, that's uh, a lot of, uh, a lot of, uh, of, so our dependence on, 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 on the, on the ecosystems is significant. And I, I, I have a, I guess I, you know, I have a video, I don't know if that's, still able to show that or not. I don't know yeah, let me go ahead and pull that up right now. Thank you. But that, that can, it's a very easy synopsis and work with US Food Sovereignty Alliance on sharing some stories of, of food sovereignty. Yes. We can know. And Carl, just 
for your information too, because this is so wonderful. For Rise Up Summer School, we shared out some of these, or we shared out all of these videos um, for our last uh -oh. session. So I'm excited that everyone gets to see it. All right, I'm gonna go ahead and play. I'm not sharing my screen. There we go. Okay. There we go. And I had a sight as if we taking flight, folks. Damn, what a crazy hand, what a still a heist, and on the night. The sight's gone, let me turn your lights on. Protect our ocean rivers, creeks, and streams for seven cents a week. My Yupik name is Anguta. Okay. And uh, from the Yupik Nation in Western Alaska. And, uh, and we share the circumpolar Inuit culture as well, but we're salmon people. And so when I think of food sovereignty, my first thought is salmon. And then in the context of the Western system, it is uh, the, the ocean and our rivers that are our garden in Western Alaska. It's the tundra that's our garden, and that's where we harvest and gather food. And that is the sovereignty that we share with the animals that continue to return. And these are migratory marine mammals, migratory fishes, migratory birds, migratory insects, migratory caribou. There's lots of migratory animals in Alaska that have a large range in which they move and share resources all the way to the southern hemisphere as well as the northern hemisphere. So at the top of Turtle Island uh, in the Arctic where the sea ice meets the, the fresh water is the beginning of our garden. It's the rich in the 24 hour sun in the summer it creates these blooms of plankton that are so rich they provide for the babies of the geese in this area in the Salish Sea that fly up there to give birth. And those those eggs and some of the some of the adults we eat as nourishment. It's that first our first food out of the winter, in the cold winter. In the winter time we don't have fresh salmon, but we can get fresh food under the sea ice and under the river ice, as well as the caribou. So food sovereignty to me is that access and that cultural importance of the sacred sacred animals the sacred waters and the sacred land that provide for us that have been providing for us for thousands of years so that's the basis of my idea of food sovereignty is that the land and the water the mountains and the air are our garden and we have to take care of it and that's what, that's that's why I'm here at the United States Food Sovereignty Alliance we be a part of a network that's caring enough for basic human di dignity and the rights to food so our children have a healthy future and aren't starving. You think of life giving springs in the Bible. Follow us under paradise like Bible. Go west, set your nest, invest in a hydro. And I know you don't care, don't mean that I don't care more desire. Amazing. Thank you for sharing that. Yeah, Carl, thank you so much. Is there anything else that you'd like to add on to what you so beautifully said in that video? I think we could continue continue on. It's it's getting yeah. Great. Um beautiful. So on to our next question. Um and starting with you, Carl, what is genetically engineered salmon and what do you see as its impact on indigenous communities and livelihoods? Um, and if you want to connect that to the Black Corporate Salmon Campaign and the work that you're doing um, on salmon in general. Okay, I'm, I'm hoping my, my audio is coming in. It's, uh, yeah, okay, great. So, yeah, so first of all, it's not even salmon, that's a marketing term. It's just, it's a frankenfish 
it's not a, it's some kind of thing that's grown uh, using genetically modified uh, pieces of different animals, including like a, uh, including eel. Uh, so these this 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 production in the lab, um, you know, they're growing them uh, these eggs uh, and. Uh, in a warehouse and warehousing them uh, also in Indiana. I know that's the, um, the Indiana location is, uh, is a US location. Um, and, 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 and I think that within the context of, uh, of food sovereignty and sustainability, they're just using the, the, the corporations are using that language. So uh, there's a lot of problems with that. First of all, it's an insult to 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 the salmon people to mess with genetically mess with our sacred salmon. This is the, uh, this is our uh, our uh, it's our, still our livelihood in Alaska, and it's a it's an important part of uh, uh, the entire ecosystem of the of, of the of the Pacific. Uh, all all species of salmon from California, Oregon, Washington, and also on the East Coast from. Japan, uh, Sakhalin, Russia, and all the way up on, on the entire Pacific, you know, the salmon come to the Arctic and feed off those, off the uh, multitude of, of they're, they're, part of, they're part of the ecosystem. So you got these, uh, anyways, the, the point is that when these large, large blooms of, of, uh, of plankton, uh, multiple species of plankton are also provide for the backdrop of of these little fingerlings, little tiny salmon, they gather together and they go up. They gather together as they move up the coast to the Arctic. And uh, so, so it's a. It, it, anyways, that's 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 real salmon. So what's what's being what what's being called GE salmon is not even salmon. So so that's that's just the term that the corporations are using. So block corporate salmon is to is to challenge that that system of of, of warehousing salmon that never see light of day and then there is a uh, there and then also you know they're feeding them with these uh endangered and at risk uh, uh feeder fish uh, as they get bigger and bigger and bigger quickly um or whatever they are the frankenfish in these warehouses um and they're calling it sustainable healthy food and uh you still don't i mean that's just that's just the corporate 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 label on it. So, so I think that's, I hope that answers the question in a nutshell. Does that help with that? Uh, I mean, there's, there's. Yeah, thank you so much for that clarifying and helpful explanation. Um, I'm wondering if there's like how, so calling them Frankenfish, how, how it, would you want to hear that referred to? Um, like how, how should corporate salmon be called um, aside from that and, and in di longer description? Yeah, yeah, I mean, it's just, a, it's, it's an ethical and moral insult to, to, the, to the indigenous peoples, first of all. And um, but the, to all peoples, uh, especially especially people that live in salmon country. I mean, even the stellar colonial people, colonial people like have respect for the salmon um, and understand the importance to the ecosystem. I mean, uh, they're the, they're the, they naturally bring some of the richest marine nutrients to the top of the watersheds all over the. Uh, to the island, they're circumpolar. They're not circumpolar anymore because of the over the last couple thousand years, what's been happening in the, from the Mediterranean, Black Sea, uh, and Atlantic, uh, and um, but but yeah. So we've got we've got we still have some wild salmon left. So this 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 the scheme is 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 almost just to mark it out. It's like a use it to to mark it out. So I don't know. It's it's it, Technically, it's it's a frankenfish. That's the easiest way to describe it. It's just some frankenfish. It's it's a 
but but they are used yeah are marketing it in a large scale to uh, food distributors uh first and not it's not it's not it's probably not going to be uh at a, at a retail store uh, at this point they're just trying to use whatever way mechanism they can without having to label it so it's a it's it's one of those those one of those uh, subversive threats and using corporate marketing schemes to to call it whatever they want. It's the yeah. same thing like with, with corn. Yeah. And Suzanne, the interpreter, if we could just pause for one moment for an interpreter switch. You ready? Wonderful. And we're ready to go. Thank you, Carl. That's such a helpful clarification. And I think a distinction that's really important for us to all understand and to realize that corporations are not going to um, be the ones standing up for what is right and what is ethical and what is um, good for people and good for the planet. That's just not how our systems are set up. and. Um, naming that is so important and thank you for giving us that language and um, for all your work on that um yeah i would love to invite charlotte or zoltan to offer any thoughts on that before the next question if there's anything you'd like to add and feel free to pass if not yeah i'll pass i think carl did a great job and I'll talk about the solidarity in a bit. Well, I wonder then this might fit and then and we could end with um, Zoltan and his work um, on um, solidarity since that's a, a part of our um, panel discussion as well. I, I'm going to- This is my, the interpreter again, sorry, sorry to interrupt. I just got dropped. If it could be re-spotlighted, that would be great. Thank oh. you. Okay. Okay, Ray. Can you all see my screen? Oh. Not yet. Okay. Oh, that's strange because I can see it. <laughs> okay, share the screen. Um, how about now? Perfect. Awesome. So I think this really fits well. And I have a couple of slides here fits and you'd think that we put this together, Carl. <laughs> fits well with the, with what Carl was um, discussing about GE salmon and about um, uh, the frankenfish, you know. I, I, and I, I wanted to include this because I think this is so important when we talk about the cent centrality of salmon to coastal indigenous peoples and cultures. And, and Carl did talk a little bit about this, but you know what we're, you know, when we think about salmon that goes beyond just the dietary significance, um, that it provides this nutritional food for us as, as coastal indigenous peoples, um, it provides spiritual sustenance. It provides cultural sustenance. And these are a couple of quotes in my book about this, the first salmon ceremony and how you honor the spirits of that salmon um, that, would, that would bring its, its, its physical form to us every year um, as food, as spiritual and, and cultural um, sus and dietary sustenance. You're not going to be celebrating the spirit of a frankenfish. <laughs> I mean that what has what they're doing to those to those salmon and or to those fish as Carl said you can't even call them salmon anymore because they've been so manipulated. I mean what does that say to the, the spiritual connections that we have to those plants and animals that provide themselves to us as food. And salmon is so significant to our cultures and I wanted to just share a little bit about uh, about my culture and the significance of salmon. Um, and hopefully that, that, that really can resonate with all of you in, in just hearing what Carl said about this frankenfish. Um, I grew up on this river. This river runs right through our community. And one of my chapters is on this river. And, 
in my chapter is Zuma Us, the river that runs through us, because it 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 really spiritually runs through us as coastal indigenous peoples, as, as Zishat peoples. Um, and then when I was young, I, I remember being walking across this river, and there was so so many fish, especially um, miat, which is our word for salmon, sakai salmon, that you could feel them. You could almost walk on their backs. And there's many stories from coastal indigenous communities that talk about that. My grandpa was a fisherman all his life. Um, he fished even when the, the government and the fish warden said you couldn't. He was out there fishing because he knew the significance of it to our communities, to us as, as little as, you know, young a shot in our community and um, was always there to um, to support us when we went out fishing and if we did catch something if we were lucky enough he was always the person would bring our our little trouts or our little fish or little salmon to and he would cook them out because he knew that that was important to us to keep that spiritual and cultural connection not just to the tsumas but to the miata as well and one thing that we have held on to throughout um, are um, uh, through in looking at food sovereignty and throughout our history is our, our Zishad Community Fish Day. And this is really important when we talk about food sovereignty because a lot of times we look at it from this kind of theoretical overview without really looking at what's happening in our communities. Yes, we've, we've had settled, per, the perpetuation of settler colonialism and it continues to undermine our communities, but we've also, um, we struggle against it and we fight against it by continuing to keep those, those connections to our lands and to our, our waterways intact. And one way that we have done this in our community is through community fish days. And these are some photos that I've taken throughout the years of some of the people in our community pulling in a communal net. All the fish that we get in that net is shared. And we still do this today. And I'm really, really happy that it's, it's a, a food sovereignty tradition that we continually exercise. These are a couple of photos that I, um, they were photos taken from one of my um, uncles many, many years ago. The two ladies, the elders on the, la on the right are Kathy Robinson and Agnes Sam. Um, who are cutchessing, as I mentioned, this open pit fire, this way of cooking salmon. And this was, you know, part of the communal fish day, us sharing that salmon um, coming together. So again, it's more than just eating um, the salmon. It's coming together in community with the sharing, the bonding of community over sharing those foods. And this is a photo and a, a short video if anyone wants to see this or wants the presentation slides of uh, a video I took of me smoking fish with my auntie Marilyn, which I love to do. And I still carry on this tradition. If I can go home, COVID has kept me away from my community for almost two years now, a year and a half. Um, and it really is, again, about family sharing, reciprocity, knowledge transfer um, that um, my um, elders in my community, my relatives have always done that and I do that as much as I can sharing this knowledge and I end with this and I you know we um, Noel had said well maybe you can share a story so I said well I'm or I thought I'm going to share this story about fishing and the importance of fishing my sister and I were one of the first female fishing teams within our, on the river in our community um, we fished in the 1990s and um, I went to school and then got a job at UW. And so I, it's just the last couple of years that I've been able to um, go out and fish with her and we can um, have our own private nets. And so um, this, this story is from when we first uh, started fishing in the 90s and we were so excited. We got this great fish attire you know, and went out fishing and never thought to ask anybody about how you set a net or when you set a net or where you set a net. We just went out there and set it and secured it out on a pole on the, in the river and left it out there for four hours. And then we came back and we caught a lot of salmon. The only thing, the salmon weren't in the river. They were up hanging from the pole because we ended up setting our net when it was high tide. And when the tide shifted <laughs> about five or six feet, there was our net with all our fish sitting up there, <laughs> boiling in the sun. <laughs> so I say tidal shift lesson was quickly learned.
So my sister and I, my sister's been fishing um, um, for many, many years, and it's just always a joy for us to get together. And I just, so I just wanted to end with that and to say thank you, Taiko. Thank you for allowing me to share a little bit about who I am and the significance of salmon to my people and to me. Thank you so much, Jenny, for sharing that story of learning a lesson the hard way. <laughs> um, so I'm going to pass it off to Erica to invite Zoltan into our next question. So here's to you, Erica. Uh, yeah, hello, everybody. Um, my name is Erica. I am the food justice co-chair for Community Alliance for Global Justice. I wanna thank the panelists so much for sharing what they have so far. And Charlotte, that was a great story about learning how to fish. Um, I have a question for Sultan and um, if the other two panelists want to answer it, that is totally welcome as well. Uh, but this one is, is for you, Sultan. Um, the question is, is there a role for non-natives to support Indigenous-led movements, and what does uh, solidarity look like? What can broader food sovereignty movements learn from Indigenous communities? Um, yeah, so I'll pass it off to you. Okay. I will have to... <laughs> Something is going on with my share screen. Do you have access to share your screen? Yeah, let me, uh, it's asking me for a password. I'm so sorry. Open system preferences. Okay. This is a new laptop, and I think that that's the problem. No worries. If there is anything we can do, I think settings from our end are OK. But um, we'll give you a moment to OK, yeah, sorry about that. And preferences. Why don't, uh, while I'm doing this, why don't uh, we just open it up for questions? Uh, yeah, that sounds great. Um, how about if you have a question for any of the panelists or something to add, um, either if you know how to use the raise hand function in Zoom, that's welcome, or if you want to put it in the chat. And while you have a moment to think about those questions and we can um, look them over and kind of moderate that, uh, I'd like to extend this question out to uh, Charlotte or Carl. So the question is in the chat, uh, Sam put it there, but is there a role for non-natives to support y'all and support food sovereignty in indigenous movements and communities? Yeah, I think you know. With the are you are you there? Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Yeah, I think there's a, a there is some some great examples uh, um, of roles uh, of, of of a diverse diversity supporting indigenous led movements like the resistance to uh, recently it would be you know before COVID it was resistance to the. Dakota Access Pipeline, and and um, you know, getting the getting the call out from some of the elders and and the matriarchs, uh, in 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 the in the heart of uh, Turtle Island was a uh, was a pretty big response from uh, from both both indigenous peoples around 
Carolina, but also and around the world, actually, uh, there's quite a few folks there that came from all over the world. But there's also a lot of uh, it, it was it was intense at times. So uh, and 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 that there's a ended up being a like a whole movement of, of non-native people um, coming to the camp, particularly after after the media showed the, um, uh, the, the, the dogs attacking, uh, elders and, um, and, uh, water protectors, indigenous water protectors. And so there's a huge movement of people, but that, it, 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 I think part of that was, uh, it, it was, it was important to have that, that support because sometimes, you know, when you're out there in one of the most racist places, in the world, I mean, in North America or Turtle Island, um, it's helpful to have uh, that support from whether it be, particularly with white people, because that's that's the the, the, the current structure of this violent system that we're addressing. Is like that it's from white men, you know, like these police and the authorities or whatever you might call them, the enforcement authorities and private security they're all they're all white men and uh so having white folks to be able to uh because we're already dealing with just uh, just the racism itself and then the whole system is based on racism so ha that that's that's a good way to support is, is is to have is to be present um and then asking you know what what can we do to support it? <laughs> what can we do Anyway, that that's that's what I would say on a, on a fundamental level because I've been working on multiple um, actions to take down the Snake River Dam uh, led by the Nimipu, um, and uh, I, I was sent by my elders from uh, from the Arctic and just shallow oil um, down here, and I met with the Chief Cecile Hansen and. Uh, you know, get, get, let her know that I was here in a good way, and uh, we got her to meet with some of our elders as well. So we met, and so we brought down some elders, and, and then that's uh, part of the Shell No action was a global movement, but it was a, it, it was indigenous led, and it took about ten years for non-natives to get involved. But it's been been a, sometimes that's just the way it is. But I think I'll just stop there. It looks like the slides up. I'll go ahead, Zoltan. Thank you so much for sharing. I will pass it off to you, Zoltan. Okay, can you see my, can you see my slide? Uh, we can see the slides. Uh, you might need to put them in presenter mode. Yep, there we go. Okay. Yeah, I'm, I'm, my apologies. This is a new laptop and I had to go through the whole security thing to be able to share on Zoom. Um, uh, my name is Zoltan Grossman, again, from the, the Evergreen State College, Geography and Native Studies. And Heather and Noel wanted me to um, basically to show my work on unlikely alliances. And I'll go through this pretty quickly, mainly for the images, uh, some of my maps. But this is uh, my book, Unlikely Alliances, Native Nations and White Communities Joined to Defend Rural Lands. Um, and that examines uh, alliances of tribes with their local white neighbors, ranchers, farmers, fishers uh, across the country, and who went through stages from conflict to cooperation, asserting their treaty rights, getting a white backlash uh, over the resources over fish and water, and then fighting against common outside threats uh, that emerge from the companies, especially mining companies or government, and this is part of a much larger, I don't have time to get into it, but the idea of the politics of difference and unity that are usually identity politics or treaty rights are usually counterposed to unity politics around common ground, such as the environment. But I find they're not in contradiction because treaties uh, protect the land. I was inspired, I think, by my teachings from the two sides of my family, my father, a Holocaust survivor, who taught me appreciation of the universal similarities of people. And then from my mother's side, my grandma, here she is baking pastries, our food tradition, keeping the traditions and language alive. And it's 
the idea of appreciating cultural differences among people. And I've always tried to reconcile these teachings in my head. And um, I started as an activist in South Dakota. I grew up in Minneapolis, actually, around the uh, heyday of the American Indian Movement, and joined a group called the Black Hills Alliance um, of Lakota, of white ranchers and environmentalists who stopped uh, uranium and coal mining plans in, in the Sacred Hills. It was very inspiring to bring those communities together. Um, that's a direct antecedent of the Cowboy Indian Alliance that later uh, stopped the Keystone XL pipeline twice. And then um, in Wisconsin, um, I was involved in a movement uh, for fishing rights in Ojibwe Cedar Territory in Northern Wisconsin to protect not only the fish, um, but also the wild rice. And there were a number of very uh, violent conflicts, mob harassment uh, by white sport fishers of um, the uh, Ojibwe exercising their treaty rights. I was part of a group, Midwest Treaty Network, to monitor and deter that violence and also to discredit the environmental claims of the anti-treaty groups. And we were asked uh, to start opposing the mining companies. And we educated a lot of those white, uh, white sport fishers, not the uh, follow, not the leaders, but the followers of some of those groups, um, that mining, metallic mining is the real threat to the fish and that treaties protect the land, water and foods for everyone and uh, successfully got them to come over. And in particular in areas where the tribes had asserted their fishing rights the strongest. And we found this, this ironic situation that where the conflict had been the most intense over treaty rights, the alliances to stop the mining companies and protect the fish happened earlier and were stronger than in other parts of the state. And this culminated in defeat of a metallic mine at Crandon near Mole Lake. And we just found that the treaty rights conflict opened the path to environmental cooperation by forcing the white neighbors to learn about treaty rights and native cultures. So here in Washington, I've been here since 2005. And this is kind of the epicenter of treaty rights history. You're all probably aware of the Bolt decision in 1974, uh, which reaffirmed that recognized uh, the tribe's ability to fish in usual and accustomed places. This led in 1989 to co-management between the tribes and the state, the government to government relationship, the people to people relationship has been slower to develop. Um, okay. but this is Tammy, the interpreter. Can we pause for just a moment to switch interpreters, please? No problem. No problem. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And as soon as we get everything going, I'm guessing that we're good to go. All right. Oh, uh, Tammy needs to be highlight spotlighted. Right. I believe there she is spotlighted now. Yep. Yeah. Absolutely. Good. All good. Okay. Thank yeah, you. And, Thank you. And, and the situation of co-management has led to amazing collaborative salmon habitat restoration in the state. Indigenous decolonization is beginning to heal watersheds and their estuaries throughout the state to recover salmon stocks and to begin to roll back some of the damage that was inflicted by what Charlotte was referring to earlier, uh, settler colonialism. Uh, one of the best examples is Nisqually, where the tribe is the lead entity in salmon habitat restoration plans that are followed by other government agencies, protecting the main stem of the Nisqually, removing dikes to restore the uh, Nisqually Delta so the tides can go in and out naturally. The culverts case where treaty rights have been used as a wedge to force the state of Washington to repair culverts that are harmful to the salmon and uh, to build only uh, salmon friendly culverts in the future. Uh, the removal of the Elwa Dam, the lower Elwa Clallam tribe leading the way um, to uh, uh, destroy these dams and uh, get salmon uh, back into the river and to build up the estuary. Our class uh, recently with Alex McCarty uh, from Macaw uh, produced an online book, Removing Barriers, Restoring Salmon Watersheds Through Tribal Alliances, that told some of these stories of dam removals and various Washington watersheds, 
And uh, the proposed removals on both the Snake and Klamath rivers, uh, I saw Carl had free the snake on, on his t-shirt. And uh, that's a real um, a strong movement uh, right now to um, uh, protect, to, to, re to restore salmon and orca. And so we have this government to government relationship and then other places like in Wisconsin, there was no government to government relationship, but there was a good people to people relationship. And what I find is the strongest is to have parallel tracks where you have both uh, relationships built from the top and from the bottom to effectively reinforce each other. And the best example, I think, are the fossil fuel alliances that we've seen um, recently in the Northwest. Shipping is the Achilles heel of the fossil fuel monster. As I showed on this map, the uh, fossil fuels, the coal and oil are locked up in interior basins in Alberta, in North Dakota, in Montana, Wyoming, and they have to ship the oil and coal to the coast via rail or pipeline. They also have to ship equipment, extraction equipment from our, our, um, our coast. So um, the best example of a victory is at Cherry Point, where the Lummi uh, nation stopped uh, along with allies um, and uh, uh, fishing and environmental allies stopped a coal terminal that would have destroyed a sacred burial ground and a historic reef net fishing site uh, together with the fishers and crabbers. And um, Army Corps of Engineers denied the permit because of treaty fishing rights. Um, there's been a number of movements, alliances against Bakken oil being brought in by rail uh, to the Pacific Northwest. This is a map I made of the connections between the Bakken oil shell basin and uh, the state of Washington. Uh, both oil trains, the oil terminals proposed for Grays Harbor and extraction equipment going in. This is a conceptual map I made of the same thing of the Bakken oil fracking monster having connections through the exploding oil trains, fracking sands, uh, Dakota access pipeline uh, to various parts of the continent. And of course, this is the same oil that is shipped through the Dakota access pipeline that was um, so strongly opposed at Standing Rock. I was there in September of 16, in time to see the Pacific Northwest canoes come in an amazing display of solidarity. And these Bakken oil port terminals um, in Washington were all defeated in Vancouver, in Grace Harbor. Beautiful rally in Hoquiam of shared waters, shared values to protect not only the salmon, but also the razor clams along the coast. We've had a number of other alliances uh, carry out blockades in solidarity for oil, against oil fracking supplies being unloaded at the Port of Olympia and put on trains to North Dakota and quite a bit of uh, uh, police uh, violence against uh, the blockade. We've had blockades of uh, large equipment going to extract uh, tar sands in Alberta and the Nez Perce, Umatill and Warm Springs tribes have been directly involved in that successful movement to stop um, uh, some of the equipment on some of the routes. Now the big movement is the Trans Mountain Pipeline coming from Alberta to both BC and to Washington, uh, threatening uh, salmon and orcas in the Sailor Sea with a doubling of an existing pipeline. And of course, we also have natural gas, the Wet'suwet'en opposition to a BC uh, gas pipeline the Puyallup opposition to the fracked gas uh, plant in Tacoma um, have built amazing alliances. So this collectively is called the Thin Green Line. Tribes and First Nations are leading the opposition. 14 oil and port, uh, coal port terminals have been defeated in this choke point of the Pacific Northwest. And it's because of the power of treaties and sovereignty centered on protecting traditional foods, salmon, clams, et cetera. And in closing, I want to talk about another area of alliance building around climate resilience. At Evergreen, we have the Climate Change and Pacific Rim Indigenous Nations Project that studies the effects of, climate, of the climate crisis that Charlotte has been mentioning on Native cultures and um, uh, produced a book, um, Asserting Native Resilience, Pacific Rim Indigenous Nations Face the Climate Crisis. And um, so there are several encouraging areas. One is cooperation and land use planning, uh, the Swinomish tribe working with usually hostile 
local governments in the Skagit River Basin on flood prevention, Nisqually working with Olympia on moving sources of fresh water. Instead of waiting for the UN or Congress or the White House to do something, stitch together a patchwork of watershed-based solutions led by tribes. Um, adopting renewable energies, the Tulalip tribes have worked with um, uh, dairy farmers uh, to keep cattle waste out of salmon streams and instead convert it into biogas for renewable energy. Fantastic example of an alliance. Uh, securing water sources, Tulalip has also been reintroducing beaver to regulate water flow um, during uh, spring floods uh, made worse by climate change and summer droughts. And uh, one area I've been really interested in lately is local disaster planning, tribal and local governments working together, tribes being models to non-native neighbors in emergency planning because they can only rely on each other. And some coastal tribes are having to move to higher ground to avoid tsunamis and sea level rise. And this really brings out the different Western and indigenous survival systems. Western society is very top heavy and centralized, reliant on Supp long supply chains that we see fail in instances like we saw before the blizzard um, a couple of years ago. Uh, but tribes retain a sense of community, of mutual responsibility of taking care of each other. And I think that's symbolized by the Quileute salmon bake here. And even during the pandemic, we see this happening time and time again, tribes in the lead of providing vaccines um, uh, to, to non-native communities that are not getting them. So I've been writing about this, I call it the resilience doctrine. So in conclusion, um, some of the criteria for successful relation, for successful alliances to grow. One is a common sense of place, how close you are to an environmental threat, how sacred you see that place, whether it's sacredness in your um, spirituality or in your value system, and how through an alliance, mutual cultural education can happen where especially non-natives can learn about native cultures lasting long after the alliance is over. A common sense of purpose, uh, tribal legal and political powers establishing clout um, in non-native communities, corporations or governments becoming the common enemy, gaming equalizing um, uh, uh, the uh, reservations and border towns uh, economically. Um, and then finally, a common sense of understanding of consciously trying to overcome the longstanding conflict to try and begin to dismantle settler colonialism, using the people who have um, been in between, who can build a bridge between the two communities. So this um, is a quote from Billy Frank Jr. in the forward to asserting native resilience. We're all dependent on the health of our ecosystem, wh whoever we are and whatever we do. Once people understand this, we will all be able to join hands in dealing with the environmental challenges that fix us. So this is, um, these are a few of the publications I mentioned. I'll put uh, links to them in the chat. So thank you so much and apologies for earlier. Oh, no apologies. Thank you so much, Zoltan, for that amazing um, overview. Um, with that, we are at time. We're a little bit over. So thank you, everyone, for staying on here. Oh, um, Charlotte, I do. I know we are at time, and so I want to be conscientious of that. But Charlotte, if you do have any thoughts, um, I know we didn't get to you. Um, and also, just feel free to pass on those. But I know we would love to hear. Yeah, no, I'm... Um... Zoltan covered um, some of the areas and some of the um, some of the uh, wonderful work that's being done with these alliances, and so I'm really glad, Zoltan, that you did that. You covered, you know, what what we've been seeing, where people have been coming together, not just Indigenous peoples but non-Indigenous allies in in supporting our struggles for um, for our homelands, for our waterways, especially what's happening on the Northwest Coast. One that I wanted to add, Sultan, is the Idle No More. I mean, we don't hear a lot about it, um, about this movement um, uh, that much anymore, but it was very significant in creating um, these larger, not just um, 
uh, alliances within Canada, the United States, but we saw it become a global movement where there are people throughout um, the world that were coming together in support of indigenous rights, indigenous treaty rights, indigenous sovereignty, um, and especially in, um, in uh, this um, creating awareness around what Canada was trying to do in opening up um, areas for economic development that would have led to environmental destruction. And the importance of that is the movement that was created was started by um, an, an ally of three indigenous women and one um, non-indigenous uh, non woman. Um, and so the fact that you can bring people together from different areas, um, different um, communities, but we can all engage together because if anything, it's the, the good of Mother Earth that we are all fighting for, that we have a place here, not just for us to live, but a place for the generations, or as Indigenous people say, seven generations, that we will have a um, um, healthy world for them to live in as well. Amazing. Thank you for that addition here. Um, okay, I am going to share a quick screen, my screen really quickly. Um, we just wanted to highlight here. First off, we want to say thank you so, so much to our panelists. Thank you, Charlotte, Carl, and Zoltan for sharing so much wisdom, sharing your personal stories, sharing just the knowledge that you have on Indigenous food sovereignty and the role of solidarity. Um, you can connect with them. Uh, we'll send out some information to people who have registered, um, but Charlotte has a book coming out. I think, I believe you said at the beginning of 2022, um, I, for one hand, cannot wait to read that. I'm looking forward to diving into your existing book um, as well. And um, Carl, uh, thank you also for sharing your uh, lived experience. Um, and you can check him out uh, taking part in Block Corporate Salmon. Carl, I don't know if you have anything else that is going on that you would want to plug as well. Um, I would love to hear from you. Great, if you do, um, we will thank you via email and we can send out any other information. And Zoltan, um, I know you have a book as well called Unlikely Alliances, so thank you for giving us insight into that. Um, taking action, we will also send out um, some links to, if you know uh, Chef, uh, to sign the Chef Pledge uh, to not bring uh, GE or Frankenfish, excuse me, um, into your restaurant. Um, and then you can sign the individual boycott as well. And as always, follow boy or at Block Corporate Salmon on Instagram for the most up to date information. Um, we will again send these out via email to everyone who's registered. So thank you so much for being a part of this. Um, I'm going to stop sharing my screen and just say thank you to everyone. Have a wonderful evening. Really, really, really appreciate it. And yes, thank you so much to our interpreters, uh, Tammy and Suzanne, just a beautiful, beautiful job. So thank you for doing this as well. Mwah. Have a wonderful evening. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you to our panelists. This will be recorded you. on our YouTube channel so you can share it. Have a good night, y'all.